Today, I combine mead with my favorite kind of tea. So, Ruibos is my favorite tea, and it's actually the dried leaves from a South African bush. That's where it gets its name from. Red bush is Ruibos. I'm not sure on the language on that. I'm sure somebody can tell me, but my research said that that's what it was. It is a non-caffeinated tea. and that is, It's not a genuine, authentic tea plant, but it is a plant used for making tea or tisane, as a lot of people will call it. Today, we're just going to make it into a mead. So what I did was, I figured out a gallon has about 16 cups of tea, eight ounces. I did eight instead of six. I probably should have done six, but I did eight. So we're going to continue on with that. And I thought, well, how big is a tea bag? Because we have loose rooibos tea. So I said two, te two teaspoons. So I did two teaspoons per cup, figured that out to a gallon. So I used 32 teaspoons of tea in our huge rumble jar filter that we got. I mean, Check that sucker out. It's like awesome. But anyway, that... and the reason why we use this, we've been wanting to use this since we've been gifted these, but the Ruibos tea is these little tiny twig like yeah. things. And so Brian was just going to dump it in there loose. And I'm like, <laughs> that is going to be so annoying. But we had these huge rumble jar and it worked filters. Perfection. Except that I have nowhere to put it right now. Want to see behind the scenes and more information from City Setting? Join the VIP. Link in the description. So, like I said, I used 32 teaspoons of the tea in roughly three quarters of a gallon because the rest is going to be made up with honey. And yes, you might have noticed that this bottle of honey just changed because I had the wrong one up here. <laughs> it was wildflower before, but I actually want this to have a citrusy taste because Rebo's kind of is a little citrusy almost. It's a unique flavor. I can't really explain it. You have to try it for yourself. So I'm going to use orange blossom honey. I'm also going to be putting in some orange peel just for a little extra added from the citrus. So let's get started on this. Before we even get started on this, everything that we touch has been sanitized in the red bucket of sanitization. I'm so glad people like that. Just saying. <laughs> anyway. So what I want to do is we have our one gallon fermenter here and we make one gallon batches because if I put a three gallon or five gallon on here, you wouldn't be able to see me, which to some people might be a good thing, but I like to be able to see you. So it doesn't work both ways. Anyway, so I want to get some honey in here. There's one thing we're missing. What's that? A funnel. Okay. So once you have your stuff on the scale, you want to tear everything out because everything from here forward is going to be the honey that we actually want to put in there. So I have a funnel on there and I'm going to open this guy up. We did not um, warm this up first. How much honey am I going to use today? Well, I'm going for a specific number here. I I figured it out to 1.130 for my gravity. I think that's a little high. So I'm going to go with just a touch lower. So I'm going to use three and a half pounds of honey today. Enjoying this video? Give us a like. And to see more, hit subscribe. So our honey is in, and that means I don't really need the scale anymore. As you can see, it's thick stuff. It's still coming out of the funnel. Now, when you're pouring large amounts of honey through a funnel into a fermenter, it's a good idea to have a second person with you. So that way one of you can keep an eye on the scale while the other person can keep an eye on the funnel. We have overfilled our funnel and poured honey all over our table before. So I think it was the rosemary mead. <laughs> yeah. So you keep track of both ends. I was watching the scale. And she was just balancing the funnel, and I overfilled the funnel and started... Yeah. yeah. It was fun. You didn't see that at all, because, you know, the magic of editing. <laughs> okay, so this is all pouring out. There's still quite a bit of honey in there. And this liquid, the tea, we've let cool. It's down to probably about 110 degrees or so, and that'll help to mix well with the honey, and it'll also clean out the funnel as I pour it in. So I only want to put about half in at first so that I can mix this up real good. And I'm just going to try to rinse off that funnel. Okay, so once I'm pretty satisfied that I rinsed that out, I'm just going to drop this guy in here because it's fine. And I'm going to use what I call my thumb saver bung. It's actually just a solid bung. I'm going to put it in the top so I can shake this up. In the very beginning of fermentation, you want to add oxygen. 
oxygen into this. Okay, it's it's a common idea that you don't want oxygen in your brew, but the yeast actually need it in the beginning so that they can build up the colony. Then once they built a colony, then they get to work consuming and converting to alcohol. So in the beginning, you want some oxygen in there. So a good shake. Shake the bejesus out of this. Once you've shaken it for a while, be very, very careful when you decide to take the bung out because it might spit at you. Or not. Might not come out. There we go. Okay. So I have that fairly well shaken up, but I'm starting to see honey forming on the bottom. So guess what? There's still some bejesus left in there. Also notice the color change. That's from air being mixed in with it. You want that. Okay. We're going to put that back into turbos for a second. And what I also wanted to do is I took the peel off of say half an orange and it's literally just the peel. We tried not to get the pith. You always get a little bit good pith makes it a little bit bitter, but the amount that I got here won't matter. And I'm just going to drop these in. They do become a little difficult to get back out later, but we'll deal with that another day. And now I want to fill it the rest of the way with our uh, tea. How greedy do I want to be? There's a lot of foam there. Once that foam dies down, I think we'll be okay. So I'm going to put a little bit more in. Derek just had an interesting idea. I could put the yeast right in now and then I can rinse it out with that. But, um... I like to live a little bit more dangerously than that. So instead, I'm just going to dump it right into the fermenter. You might be wondering, why am I not hydrating the yeast? Well, because would the yeast really know the difference if I hydrate it in the water or if I hydrate it in here? I don't think so. And the last, what, 20, 30, 40 brews that we've made have shown that there's no difference. So that's why we don't do it anymore. What I am going to do, though, is I'm using half a packet because... My rule, as you might know if you've watched any of our brews, is for up to three gallons, use half a packet of yeast. For over three gallons, use a full packet. If you're using three gallons, do whatever you want. Oakley doakley. I'm making one, so I'm going to use half a packet. And I always seem to have an, a half packet of 71B laying around. I don't know why, but it seems like every single time we make a brew, it's a half packet of 71B. Never open a full packet anymore. And I did a pretty good job getting it in there. A little bit got on the sides. No big deal. But now what I want to do is get that bung again, and I'm just going to shake this up some more. And all I want to do now is just kind of get that yeast in there, give it a good swirl so it doesn't stick to the neck, and then I'm going to shake it up a little bit more. Ugh, it's a lot heavier now. That's why I like to do it with half gallons. If you're doing this in a three or five gallon, I suggest getting some sort of wand or large spoon to do the mixing and heat your honey, because if you don't, now, and I don't mean heat it like hot, I mean like to 110 or so. Not enough to change the flavors, but just enough that it'll run a lot easier and mix in a lot easier. Next step, we're going to take a hydrometer reading. We do this to find out how much we actually got in there for sugars, find out a potential for alcohol, and see just how good my measurements really were. One little trick, if you get bubbles or foam, give it a spin. It'll disconnect from the bubbles usually just long enough to give you a decent reading. And where are we? looks like 1.112 to me. That is a pretty decent gravity. I would have liked it to be maybe slightly higher, but it's okay. If this comes out dry, we can always back sweeten later. Not really a problem. We used to believe in trying to hit that gravity or surpass that, that tolerance every single time. And I've since learned that, well, yeast don't know the rules. So just because this is a 15% yeast doesn't mean that it's going to stop at 15. It might stop at 16. It might stop at 14. We've seen both. 71B, we call it 71 beast. But in reality, it is just a yeast. It is just a fungi. And it's going to do what it's going to do. We can't really control that. So better to err on the side of caution and then let it, okay, it goes dry. We just add a little back sweetening to it. No big deal. All right, what I want to do now is seal this up for fermentation. And to do that, I just use a bung and an airlock. I am using the S-type airlock just because I like them better. Um, no particular reason other than aesthetics. I just, the three-piece airlocks, I just don't think they're as neat looking. But people say that they're easier to clean. Either one works perfectly fine. They do the exact same thing. This is filled with sanitizer water. You could put in a cheap alcohol or any particular scotch that you might not like. But 
what's going to happen next? This is going to go under the desk or in an area of fermentation somewhere in our house because they're starting to become numerous and varied. And it'll sit for, oh, geez, I don't know, probably two to three weeks. It's a mead. It'll, it'll need some time. All right, here we are just two days in, and you can see it's fermenting. There's bubbles coming out. It's active, but it's not crazy active. This one took a while to get started. It actually took, I think, almost like a day and a half before it was any good. And there's some foamy stuff forming inside there. I was a little concerned. It looked a little off color at first. It wasn't a problem, but it looked kind of brownish and orangey, more so than I thought it should be. And I did see things floating around inside, and I see what happened. Look at that. That is the solids from the tea already starting to fall to the bottom. I'm going to give this a really good swirl and let it keep going on its, on its way. But it is working, it's going, and we'll check on this in a while. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Have a great day.